what used to be land is now four or five foot deep. It's complete open water now. It's not just hurricanes that have battered Louisiana's coastline. Bad land management has put these valuable wetlands at risk. If we can get the word out there that conservation is somewhat a state of mind, that you have to want to do it. For this sixth generation farmer, managing resources in a way that's good for the earth is also good for the bottom line. Lots of chickens create lots of chicken poop, and that could be an environmental nightmare. But these North Carolina scientists have found a way to recycle the nutrients in that waste. So we're protecting the environment, and we're also generating a potentially new revenue stream for farmers. From the lab, to the wetlands, to the family farm, this American land is rebuilding, recycling, and having some fun. I do for combine. Hi, and welcome to This American Land. I'm your host, Ed Arnett. We've got some great stories for you today about the conservation of America's natural resources, our landscapes, waters, wildlife, and the people that are dedicated to conservation across the country. Today, I'll take you to Louisiana, where the coastline is sinking and washing away, mainly because the Mississippi River has been transformed with levees and is no longer depositing the sediment needed to block saltwater intrusion into the Delta. But there are plans to restore the Delta, and we're going there to see how it can be done. So New Orleans actually sits below sea level. It is, and that's why it flooded so bad during Katrina. And to keep the water out, you have to build levee systems. I'm with my colleague, Chris Macaluso, who's with the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. But to protect those levees, you have to have natural infrastructure like swamps and wetlands and barrier islands. This is the Maurepas Swamp. We're kind of halfway between Baton Rouge and New Orleans right now. And why is this swamp important to this entire system? You know, this swamp is important. It stores water during hurricanes. It's a great wildlife habitat. It used to be a really good fishery, but it's not connected to the Mississippi River anymore, and it doesn't get the kind of water exchange it needs. There's a lot of invasive vegetation in here, and that's why it doesn't support the fish and the wildlife habitat that it used to. The general problem is we broke the plumbing. You know, Mississippi River used to spill into this swamp, and uh, levees were built, and it blocked off those annual floods that brought the water that would flush the swamp or brought the sediment that built those wetlands. And the whole hydrology of this entire ecosystem is connected all the way to the coast, right? This is the top of the Pontchartrain Basin. If we were to get into a boat uh, in this swamp, we could go all the way to the Gulf. And there used to be a lot more land out here, is that correct? Well, that was 6.3 miles of land. All of that is gone. Just subsided and sunk it. There's no sediment coming in anymore. No replenishment from them. No, from the so river. as it sinks, there's nothing replenishing anymore. Well, Chris and I are here with Ryan Lambert. Ryan's the owner and operator of Cajun Fishing Adventures. What used to be land is now four or five foot deep. So it's just gone. It's complete open water now. You know, and we're losing almost a, a football field an hour. Losing, what, 16 miles of land a year? That's, that's ludicrous. I mean, this is the, the worst natural disaster or environmental disaster in the world. It's right here on our doorstep, and nobody even knows or cares about it. If you look on this GPS, this is my boat. This is all my trails that I've been running. The yellow is land. This should be all land. Got my all up. This island last year had trees still on it. This right here is a remnant from an old community it's called Bayou Chute. In the later years, it was just camps and people went on the weekend. But prior to that, people used to live. I mean, babies were born in these camps. All these were different houses. You know, you could actually scream to your neighbor, hey, you caught some crabs, I'll be over there in just a little bit, you know? Now, the whole culture is gone. It's a... Uh, 
it's very heartbreaking to see it happen and knowing that the doctor is a quarter mile away, eighth of a mile away, the Mississippi River. All we had to do is put her back into this marsh. She built it. We could build it back. This is what we call the red maps or the do nothing maps. So if we were to do nothing over the next 50 years, this is the land that we anticipate losing on the coast of Louisiana. This is the LSU Center for River Studies. It was formed in partnership with the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority and Louisiana State University. This center was put together to really highlight the coastal land loss problem that we're experiencing in Louisiana and some of the solutions that we're using to try to combat that problem. So Jason, tell me a little bit about this map we're looking at here. So you have anything from a structural protection project, which is designated by a pink pushpin, to some of our barrier island projects, which are represented by an orange pushpin. And it's all designed to reduce storm surge, rebuild marshes, any number of different things to actually rebuild the coast. That's, that's exactly right. The overall intent is to try to grow awareness that coastal Louisiana is disappearing faster than we can keep up. This is a small-scale physical model of the lower Mississippi River. It encompasses most of southeast Louisiana, about 14,000 square miles. In terms of physical size, you're looking at about two basketball courts side by side here. What actually is the dark coloration in the river here? They're small black plastic pellets that represent different size classes of sediment that the river naturally carries. And so it allows us to evaluate how that sediment moves with the river under changing conditions. What you're looking at here is a lot of black spread across this model. It paints a very significant picture to us. But obviously, the wetlands here near the delta, near the head of passes, uh, receive the sediment. They receive that input of nutrients and fresh water from the river. There's a lot of natural cuts and channels and crevasses that sediment freely flows through. And builds the marsh. And builds marsh. And this is, this is some of the most productive wetlands in our state. We need to try to move that upriver because some of the areas for a little bit further north in Plaquemines Parish aren't connected to the river. So this is pretty white. It doesn't have a lot of sediment distribution. Correct. There is really no connectivity to the river. That's ultimately what we want two of our first sediment diversion projects to try to remedy. And a sediment diversion is nothing more than breaching the Mississippi River levee, putting a control gated structure at that breach, and digging a channel from the river to the wetland. The, the levees were built for a good reason, to protect people from these devastating floods that obviously happen every year. I mean, if not for the levees, we wouldn't be standing right here. Right. We would be in water. We're looking at a scale constructed copy of an object. So the object that we're studying here is the lower Mississippi River. But uh, we do think that there is a balance. There is a way to reintroduce that natural process. So this model gives you information for a plan that you've written to develop solutions and conservation strategies, correct? It does, yes. It's a 50-year outlook. And in it, we have a number of projects that we think are wise investments for our coast to help restore our ecosystem. All of this headland here was rebuilt with sediment that was dredged from the Mississippi River. A dredge was in the river, picked the material up, put it in a pipe, and they pumped it here to rebuild this ridge. It's a fast way to build land, and it will work in concert with Barrier Island restoration projects and the diversion project. You know, this is not a one-off thing. This is not something that's going to happen quickly. Uh, we're going to be restoring this coast for at least the next 40 to 50 years and beyond. This is, you know, putting the bones back together of this, of this coastland. This is not just an environmental story. And basically, that coastal wetland buffer is what dampens and reduces this hurricane surge risk to New Orleans. Well, I'm here with John Lopez with the Lake Pontchartrain Basin Foundation. We're looking at the Monte Carey Spillway. It's uh, representing about 8% of the river's flow right now. The structure is located about 15 miles upriver of New Orleans, so it reduces the amount of water flowing past New Orleans and helps protect the city. This Monte Carey Spillway was built for flood protection, and it works well for that. But these kinds of structures can be used elsewhere 
to restore and protect our cypress swamps. So you'd build a spillway structure similar to this one that we're standing next to and open it and close it as needed to distribute that sediment. Exactly. It would be a controlled diversion structure. So John, I live in Colorado. Why would people in Colorado be concerned about what's going on down here in the Gulf of Louisiana? Well, there are just a whole lot of reasons. One of them is, is right here. You know, a huge amount of natural gas, petroleum moved through our state that provides an energy resource for the whole country. But between us and that refinery is the Mississippi River. The corridor here is the largest port in the entire world. The national economy is extremely dependent on this river functioning. And if we lose our coast, the river's at threat. So many beautiful things come from here, certainly in terms of the culture, the heritage. If you don't like fish, maybe you like the grain that comes through our ports. If you don't like oil and gas, maybe you like the birds that you can hunt here. Louisiana is really a sportsman's paradise. This is the way Louisiana used to look. I mean, it was all marsh like this with bayous and little canals running through it. Look how pretty that fish is, goodness gracious. You know, the river made all this as it deposited soil. It grew the marsh, and that's where Louisiana was born. So you tell people, I want to show you about coastal restoration or coastal erosion. You have to take them to what we can do, because if you take them to what's, what happened, you're just showing them open water. We're really in a race against time. Absolutely. Yeah. The governor uh, d last year declared Louisiana was still in a state of crisis. You know, this is an emergency. This is not something we can wait for. We've got to start rebuilding our coast as soon as possible. Now, we'll go to Ohio, where pollution in Lake Erie has focused attention on water runoff from nearby farming operations. Preventing nutrient runoff can be a difficult problem for farmers to handle, but there are solutions with government advisors ready to help. Imagine a drop of water landing right where you are. When it hits the ground, where is it going to flow? Even if you're on concrete, it flows through the path of least resistance to a ditch, a stream of some sort. And so you are part of that watershed. My name's Megan Burgess, and I'm the district conservationist with the Natural Resources Conservation Service in Kenton, Ohio. We are located in Northwest Ohio. The watershed that we're in all drains eventually into the Maumee River, which empties into the western basin of Lake Erie. Conservation practices can be applied on many different farm types here within the Western Lake Erie Basin. And so knowing what you're doing on your ground is important for your entire community. I'm Bill Kellogg. We run 5,000 acres here in Hardin and Wyandotte County. We raise corn, beans, and some wheat. I'm joined today by my son, Shane. We work together all the time. I'm the sixth generation in the family that's on this farm. Shane is seventh, and hopefully one of my six grandkids will take hold of it and be the eighth generation on the farm. I do for combine. The larger producers are usually the ones that are put under the microscope to look at what we're doing and how we're doing it. And if we can get the word out there that conservation is somewhat a state of mind, that you have to want to do it. There's some things that we do that takes a lot of resources and management skills. Radishes are a very common uh, cover crop that we use. And you explained to me the nutrients that it will take out of the ground, and then when it decomposes next spring, those nutrients will come back available to the crop. At Kellogg Farms, some of the conservation practices that they are working on are cover crops, improving their conservation crop rotation, 
placing their nutrients below the soil surface. This is where we've stripped till. We're not putting more fertilizer out there than we need to. We're putting it in a narrow band, and we'll cut our fertilizer cost by a third. And up here, we have a filter strip that helps filter the water through a sponge before it reaches the creek. If you're 120 feet up there where you're putting nutrients and stuff on, you, you have all this area to keep it where it's supposed to instead of going into our water. Our conservation efforts, you know, started 25 years ago probably with some waterways and containment on fertilizer. Then when the Toledo water crisis happened in 2014, we knew there was going to be a backlash over it towards agriculture. And there was 500,000 people that didn't have drinking water for, I believe it was two or three days. And it was eye-opening to everybody. You know, the water was greenish colored, a lot of algae bloom and stuff like that. and. Uh, it didn't take much at all to realize there was a problem up there. Agriculture does bear some of the responsibility, but we knew if we weren't proactive to try to help solve the problem, that there would be a certain time that everything that we'd done was mandated to us. It's good to rotate which types of cover crops you use. Back in 2014, I had to go a few days without any drinkable water. And the summer I went fishing out on Lake Erie with my son, and you know, the algae bloom was there, just as big as ever. Um, would like to see us make it better. My name is Chris Kurt. This is Kurt Farms in Hardin County, Ohio. These are the water testing stations that were installed as part of USDA's testing. It tests all the surface water that comes off of our fields for nutrients that might be caught up in the water as it flows off the field. We decided to participate in all these different programs for a whole host of reasons. There's obviously the water quality issue that we've got in Lake Erie and the Maumee watershed. Um, from an economic standpoint, I want to know what's going to keep my nutrients in the field. Because if the more nutrients that stay in the field, the less I have to apply in the future, hopefully the more money that gets put back in my pocket. What we have here is a two-stage ditch. So basically, we took a traditional V-shaped ditch, drug the sides back, and created benches. They have vegetation growing on them. So during high water events, the water flows over those benches and hopefully are filling out the nutrients coming off the field. A lot of these practices have been around for generations. So this is a drainage control structure. Well, I'm, not, I'm not the first person to put in a filter strip. I'm not the first person to put a drainage control structure in. But with the help of this testing, we're going to find out some good solid data, some solid facts that are going to tell us, OK, this practice keeps phosphorus in the field. This practice doesn't. NRCS Ohio helped lead the charge to bring targeted funding to the watershed. So although farmers in the area were already doing a lot of these conservation practices, it helped provide financial support and encouragement to additional farmers. After Toledo, we got a lot more interest in nutrient management. particular farm we're at right now, my great-grandfather bought the place in 1875. We have uh, 7,200 head of hogs, and we raise the pigs from weaning on up to finish. I'm Dwayne Statler. I am a farmer from Northwest Ohio. Not every neighbor has hogs. Very little livestock here anymore. Uh, but we looked at it as a diversification for us in order to bring Anthony back home onto the farm full-time. I'm Anthony Stiller from Northwest Ohio, and I'm Dwayne's son. So this is the Ag Leader system that we've got, and this is integrated into the manure tank. Technology today has allowed us to minimize the inputs that we're putting in. That is, in return, better for the environment. We raise corn, beans, and wheat. This colder here goes in, and it's disrupting and fracturing the ground. And then manure comes down through this tube here, right down into the trench. 
And then this is a closing wheel, which takes loose dirt and sort of folds it up on top. One of the conservation practices that statelers are using is they are actually injecting their manure into the ground as they apply it, which helps keep it in place, doesn't allow it to run into the local waterways, and also helps reduce odor for their neighbors. The ground absorbs it up, and in about an hour afterwards, you can drive right on it, and you don't even realize you put any manure on. The idea came that we need to do something to preserve our ground and, and have something for the wildlife. So we thought the best thing to do is just to turn this area into a wetland. Around the big pond there, then, we'll be able to have some shrubs and stuff for the wildlife. Once the wetlands get up, I mean, it will be a nice centerpiece for us to say, OK, there's other ways to be able to go about you know, conservation. The great thing about a conservation system, like we've seen on these farms today, is that not only are we helping improve the water quality and what's leaving the farm, but the practices also play a significant role in the soil health on those farms. And by doing that, we're allowing those farms to be sustainable for generations to come. Along our coasts, algal blooms and dead zones are a persistent problem. They're linked to excessive nutrients in the water, and it's a particular issue in areas where farmers apply waste from their chicken houses directly onto fields as fertilizer. In our Science Nation report from Baltimore, Miles O'Brien has more on a novel solution. Visit environmental engineer Lee Blaney's lab, and you'll likely catch a faint whiff of, well, a barnyard. It's understandable. The contents of this bucket may look like dirt, but it's actually poultry litter. Poultry litter is a mixture of poultry manure, just chicken poop, extra feed that may not have been eaten by the birds. It could also be feathers. It could also be some of the soil on the floor of the poultry houses. With support from the National Science Foundation, Blaney and a team at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County are developing a new technology aimed at treating poultry litter and recovering nutrients from the waste. Poultry litter is actually you know, a great resource. There's a lot of phosphorus in it, there's a lot of nitrogen in it, and there's a lot of potassium. Now, those are kind of the three big fertilizers, so we usually call them NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and that's what plants need to grow. In fact, many farmers use poultry litter from their chicken houses to fertilize crops. And that's where the problem starts, with agricultural runoff. Too many nutrients in the water feed algal blooms, which suck up oxygen. That, in turn, causes dead zones. If you don't see it every day, if you're not a fisherman in the Chesapeake Bay or the Gulf of Mexico, you may not understand the scale of the issue. But if we take the Gulf of Mexico, for instance, last year the dead zone was the size of New Jersey. So if it doesn't go onto the fields, what's a farmer to do with all that litter? Poultry litter is a waste stream that currently we're kind of just throwing a lot of great nutrients and other resources away. In Blaney's view, the solution is recycling. Extract the nutrients and then sell them for profit. And so what we're trying to do here is really a win because we're protecting the environment and we're also generating a potentially new revenue stream for farmers. To do it, they make a poultry litter slurry and pump it through these tanks. They add acid and carbon dioxide, which pull the nutrients into the water. They separate out the leftover runny solid, which look like, well, you know. Then we take that water, we bubble air through it, and we add some base and we bump the pH back up. When we get to around pH 9, we're actually able to precipitate a molecule called struvite. Struvite is a valuable slow-release fertilizer that farmers could then sell. And those leftover solids, the nutrients, are mostly gone but the solids are still rich in carbon. Farmers can spread it on their fields to help soil hold more nutrients and water. We really need to have a holistic approach to considering these systems. 
and especially our waste streams. And so if we're helping farmers generate profit, stay in business, keep producing the products that we use every day while protecting our environment, it really is a win-win for all of us. Engineering new ways to recycle waste, creating new revenue streams for farmers, and protecting waterways. Miles O'Brien reporting. And now, here's a quick look at stories from our next show. Uh, one of the things that binds us as Americans and as Montanans is this deep uh, affinity for public lands and access to those lands. But what's the future of a federal fund set up to protect public lands and natural resources? Our business is really built on the back of public lands and public land access. You know, without that, people don't have a place to recreate. So, you know, without public lands, we really don't have a customer base. We really don't have a business. Thank you. And so for us, the regular guy, the regular citizen who lives here, has a chance to get out on the water and get out in the mountains uh, in a way that, that wouldn't exist if we didn't have public lands. And we're doing a lot of experimentation to make the environment better, not only here on our farm, but for the people in our community. We are really happy to see these individual species here today. What that tells us is, compared to the samples that we've done in the past here, that this stream is in good shape. It hasn't degraded over time. Um, so landowners in this watershed are doing a great job. Farming may be an ancient profession, but these innovators are coming up with techniques to keep water cleaner and land healthier. Next time on This American Land. That's all for now, and thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on This American Land. For more information about this program, visit thisamericanland.org and like us on Facebook.